Welcome everybody to our book club meeting and for joining us for read along with Suna Pranta with two fantastic authors today who I admire deeply, Avni Doshi and Janvi Barua. And thank you, Shomak, for also being here to moderate this conversation between these two authors. We started Book Club Online to engage with authors like you, so I'm very happy that we've consistently managed to uh, introduce new novels and women writers into our program. A little bit about our authors today. Avni Doshi was born in New Jersey. She was awarded the Tybo Jones South Asia Prize in 2013 and the Charles Pick Fellowship in 2014. Her writing has appeared in Grantha and the Sunday Times. Her debut novel, Burnt Sugar, which was also released as Girl in White Cotton, is on the Booker Prize 2020 shortlist and has been translated into 15 different languages. Janavi Barua is a writer based in Bangalore, India. Her debut collection of short stories, titled Next Door, was longlisted for the Frank O'Connor International Story Award. Her next novel, Rebirth, was shortlisted for the Man Asian Literary Prize and the Commonwealth Writers Prize. Undertow, the one we focus on today, was longlisted for the JCB Prize for Literature in 2020. She studied medicine at university but is not a practicing doctor. She was born in Gawati and raised between Assam, Meghalaya, Delhi and Manchester. Soma Koshal is a journalist, editor and writer. He has written for a range of Indian and international magazines, including but not limited to The Telegraph, Mint, HuffPost, Vogue India and The Caravan magazine. Thank you all of you for being here today. I'm going to hand it over to our authors to do a short uh, reading from their novels. I'm just going to read a little bit from the beginning of the novel. I would be lying if I said my mother's misery has never given me pleasure. I suffered at her hands as a child and any pain she subsequently endured appeared to me to be a kind of redemption a rebalancing of the universe where the rational order of cause and effect aligned. But now I can't even the tally between us. The reason is simple, my mother is forgetting and there is nothing I can do about it. There is no way to make her remember the things she has done in the past, no way to baste her in guilt. I used to bring up instances of her cruelty casually over tea and watch her face curve into a frown. Now she mostly can't recall what I'm talking about. Her eyes are distant with perpetual cheer. Anyone witnessing this will touch my hand and whisper, enough now, she doesn't remember, poor thing. The sympathy she elicits in others gives rise to something acrid in me. Sometimes I refer to Ma in the past tense, even though she is still alive. This would hurt her if she could remember it long enough. Dilip is her favorite person at the moment. He is the ideal son-in-law. When they meet, expectations don't fly in circles around their heads. He doesn't remember her as she was. He accepts her as she is and is happy to re reintroduce himself if she forgets his name. I wish I could be that way, but the mother I remember appears and vanishes in front of me, a battery operated doll whose mechanism is failing. The doll turns inanimate, the spell is broken. The child does not know what is real or what can be counted on. Maybe she never knew, the child cries. I wish India allowed for assisted suicide like the Netherlands not just for the dignity of the patient, but for everyone involved. I should be sad instead of angry. Sometimes I cry when no one else is around. I am grieving, but it's too early to burn the body. Thank you, that was beautiful. Uh, I'm reading a very short section from the middle of my new novel, Undertow. Uh, a little background, it's um, between uh, the story runs between a granddaughter who's never been to her grandfather's house in Assam. She's come in now and she's um, also never seen her mother um, as a mother was before she was a mother, before she was married off. And in this big house, she's um, seeking to um, find um, her mother in a way. She's looking for a mother here. And uh, how she does this is she goes around the house 
in, in the siesta time in the afternoon in, in Assam, between two and five houses shut down. Uh, nobody um, sort of stirs. I think many, many warm places, perhaps in Goa, I know in Mangalore they do. And uh, the girl creeps around the house trying to find out things about her mother. So a short passage from what happens on one of those afternoons when she is um, sort of excavating the house. The day after the storm, the rain which had eased up in the early hours of the morning began anew just before lunch. Sheets of water fell across the river and the hill and soon the hedge bordering the garden was just a smudge. Even with a shawl draped around her shoulders, Loya was cold. She drew her legs up under her on the soft cushion of the cane chair in the veranda. The drumming of the rain on the tin roof infuriated her. She felt stifled, hemmed in by the ring of water. On television flashed scenes of flooded streets in Guwahati's many low-lying streets. Loya was shocked to hear that people had died in the storm. She saw the picture of an infant who had died, electrocuted when a live cable fell into the water. The mother sat with a tiny body on her lap, refusing to give it up for cremation. When will this rain stop, she asked at lunch. Hard to say, Raman said. He seemed cheerful on such a dismal day. Loya could blame many things later. The incessant rain that played havoc with her nerves, the unsettling call from Jyoti, even her periods that her, had her insides tied up in knots, all of these, and yet none of them. After lunch, Torun took to bed and Roman vanished into his room. Biran went to drop Sita at her basti and Ramlal went with them. More restless than usual, Loya roamed the dim house. The curtains had been left open this afternoon. There was no sun to guard against. The rain still fell in a steady drizzle. In the governor's drawing room, there was a cabinet of dark polished wood against the wall that Loya had not yet explored. She sat down on the floor and slid open one of the shutters. Inside were neat stacks of what looked like photo albums. Very gently, Loya lifted one onto her lap. The photographs fixed on the thick black pages by triangular corner tabs were protected by thin pages of crackling translucent paper between them. There were pictures of Bikram, her cousin, when he was a boy. The pictures were mostly of him. Bikram with Arun Mama and Sonia Mami, Bikram with Torun and then with Usha. Loya stopped to peer into the last. She had not paid much attention to the photograph of Usha that Jitu had shown her. So immersed was Loya in the album on her lap that she did not hear Torun's door open. She did not hear his footsteps. Only when a shadow fell across did she look up. Torun was standing over her, his face dark with fury. How dare you, he began. Loya was bewildered. What have I done? Sneaking around behind my back and looking into things that don't concern you. Torun's voice was low, but hard with anger. What things? Loya's face was hot now. The albums, they are private. Loya closed the album carefully and put it gently on the floor. She stood up to her full height. Is that right, she said softly just as your family has been private all these years. Torun looked up at her, his jaw set. Loya went on gently. So private, it could not let a daughter into it. Watch your tone, young lady. Torun was louder now. Loya found herself beginning to shake and you watch yours. Torun's face turned red. He raised a finger. Don't you dare, he said. I am not spoken to like this. I can see that. No wonder things are as they are. Well, now you listen to me for once. Do you know what you did to us? Do you? She shook her fist. You killed my mother, do you hear? You killed her. Quiet. I will not be quiet. Do you know what it is like to be shut away in a flat to human beings that everyone forgot about? Roman had run in. He put a hand on Torun's shoulder. Stop, he said. No, I will not stop, Torun said. A lawyer said. Murderer. Get out of my house. Don't, dear Tara, Roman said. Don't say that. Lawyer felt the tears welling up. She would not let this lot see her crying. She turned around and ran out of the house into the drizzle. Um, so this is the fight. This is kind of a flashpoint when things start moving in a different direction in the book. Thank you, Agni. Thank you, Janavi, for those two very marvelous passages. So potent and powerful. And I'm sort of tempted to quote a cliche, which is Kafka saying that a book must be the ax to break the frozen sea inside us. And that is something very true in this case, I feel. You know, although it's a cliche we have heard it a million times, but in both of your books, 
from page one itself, you're sort of dragged into this world of the book in a very brutal way, and you can't quite, quite stop reading it until you've sort of finished it, as it were. So before I get into the specifics of the book, uh, I know both of you spent many years working on the books that you wrote. Uh, in Abni's case, you have mentioned this repeatedly in interviews, how difficult it, it was for you to go through so many drafts, so many years. And Janavi, I also know that this book came after a gap of almost nine or 10 years. Um, how was it to deal with this long period of gestation as a writer? If you could tell us that first, and then we get into the books proper. Sure. So I, I've said this so many times, and this is now becoming my little cliche, I'm afraid, where, uh, yeah, so seven, seven years, eight drafts. It, it took a very long time to get to the one you see before you today. Um, I think it's interesting because in a way, all the drafts that came before were a sort of preparation for the one I wrote uh, in the end. But I don't think I knew it at the time. Each draft that I came to, I felt that was the one. I thought I was doing a great job with it. And it was only when I came to the end and I looked at the work I had done that I saw, no, this is terrible. And I kind of had to tear it all up and start again. Um, but now in retrospect, I can kind of see that uh, each draft was a kind of learning process, not only learning how to write uh, through the different drafts, but also um, getting to know the characters. Uh, some of the drafts I wrote were in the first person, all told from the perspective of the narrator as a child. Some were told from the perspective of the mother character. Uh, some were told in third person. And, you know, some were some went as far back as to even tell the story of the grandparents uh, living during and after partition. So all of these um, different aspects of writing those drafts, they ended up in a way, I think, feeding into the novel as it is now, <clears throat> but I didn't really know it. But in a way, when I started writing this last draft, I could see I felt I knew the character so well and so deeply. And it's only because I had spent, I mean, I guess, you know, seven years just uh, creating all their backstories and histories. Right. I mean, it's very interesting that you bring up the, the, the fact that you wrote it through different perspectives. And I'm going to come to that later. Um, but Janavi, would you tell us, like, how was it for you to get back with this book after so many years? I think it's a very similar story to Avni's actually. Um, it's not that I didn't uh, write for a long time after, after Rebirth. I started almost immediately and um, similarly, almost eight years, almost nine drafts. And I'm someone who doesn't redraft. I mean, the previous two books, I, I don't think I redrafted. I just went through a kind of check, you know. Uh, and um, a very similar story in that um, I wrote every draft. It felt very perfect. It felt um, like the right draft. But something just wasn't right. And I felt I could change something, do something better. And um, with me, what happened was um, the last draft, the book uh, that we see today, was the shortest, the slimmest. I almost, uh, it was like a distillation almost over the years. And uh, I think I did away with 30% of the original book. So this is like two thirds of what, what had been originally. And uh, like Avni said, I say, you know so much of the backstory and as I'm redrafting, um, you know, there's almost almost a continuity problem. I feel, um, you know, um, the reader knows this already and I forget to put something in. I have to go back and add something more, you know, so there was those structural uh, things. Um, I, I had difficulty with the fact, again, perspective. I was speaking from the point of view of both lawyer and the grandfather. And in certain drafts, I felt I was partial to lawyer. In the other, I thought I was being partial to Torun. And uh, I kept trying to find that balance. That, that's what took me uh, quite some time to do, apart from some period of ill health. And um, in the end, I think um, um, I'm fortunate, I guess. I just knew that the balance was right, the pitch was right, and that's a book in front of us. Right. I'm actually very sort of um, moved by this sort of slow gestation because, you know, in the current publishing scenario, all we think about is time, like how quickly you're finishing something, how many books you're getting out, and the process of publishing becomes more important than writing itself. Uh, you write because you have to write, not because you have to publish. And that is something I hold on to as a thought very dearly. 
Um, yes, so, you know, like I, sorry. sorry, please. Sorry, we are kind of the, you know, the slow food movement. We're kind of the slow writers in this very fast paced, you know, publishing uh, world, I think. I have to say, I have, I have this uh, brilliant agent. I have Shruti, who you know, Shomak. And um, instead of saying, hurry up, when's the next book coming? Shruti is the sort to say, any book, good book takes eight years and you can take up to 12 years if you want. You know, I'm like, thank you so much. You know, there's no pressure at all <laughs> to finish. Absolutely. And that's why we read a book even when it's slim and it stays with us for so long. You know, it's not just the time of consumption of the book, but what it does to you after you've finished it. And uh, with this, I want to actually bring in the point about perspectives. You know, Avni, you had a very direct first person narrator who seemed to, who seems to the readers that she doesn't want to spare herself of any of the cruelty that she brings on the narrative as it were. She's very outright and she wants to give you the story as it is. Was that a process of paring down various layers of niceties and coming to this very raw, brutal voice? Um, I would say yes, to some degree, but I was also aware that uh, the narrator has experienced a great deal of trauma. And so she's, in my opinion, in this constant sort of dissociative state where um, I think part of the directness is that she is uh, completely separated from her own narrative as well. You know, she's telling this uh, story, but at the same time, um, she's kind of numb in terms of how much of it she's actually feeling. Um, and also, and also another part of it for me was, you know, she is a kind of unreliable narrator. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, we're in this constant dance. I, I think we, if not we necessarily, the reader is in a constant dance with her, I think, um, in terms of what to believe and what not to believe. So then in terms of that, I think the element of directness is again called into question because how much of this is actually true? How much of this is reliable information? Um, and, you know, memory, uh, is a kind of important theme that runs throughout the novel. And I kind of try to point out again and again that memory is something that we remember together. It's something that we uh, create together. So because her mother, the kind of primary, um, her primary caretaker in a way, and the person who would be the one to kind of um, solidify her memories uh, that person is now has Alzheimer's disease and is sort of taken out of the equation so now how reliable are Antara's memories from that perspective as well not just from the perspective that she could be lying to get what she wants but also uh, the person who she would be remembering with is no longer uh, able to have that position in her life right I think in a strange way, it, uh, this is why your book is so sort of complementary to Janavi's because that's also a mother and daughter trying to navigate memory together. But until the daughter actually returns to the past that she has left behind physically, there is no connection as such almost, you know, it sort of begins from there. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned something about this delicate dance that we as readers do with Antara. Uh, I also felt the same with Janavi's characters because uh, we don't know how to feel about some of them. You know, the things that they're telling us, Torun, for instance, um, we don't know enough about Usha, for instance, to, we only know that we, she was very cruel to her daughter and quite sort of merciless throughout her life to other people. Um, but we also don't know how to feel about Loya and how to feel about Rukmini. Um, was it a challenge, Anubi, to sort of create these characters uh, who would be constantly trying to kind of make themselves available to the readers, as it were, emotionally, and we are not ever allowed any direct access to what they are? I think this was, this was the struggle. This was the problem I faced in, in all these eight, nine years of writing, uh, wherein I didn't want to tell the reader anything. And in some drafts, I... I found I was telling the reader that, you know, um, you know, feel for Loya, please. You know, she's this um, poor girl, you know, she's had the, uh, such a tough life. 
in the end, I wanted, uh, like Avni was saying, um, understanding that they've gone, all have gone through a lot of trauma, but um, trying to step back a little. So for me, um, the third person voice worked here. That helped because that, that distance from the, um, from the subject um, was immediately created. And um, I think I try to um, kind of show them all, all around, you know, their, the good bits, the bad bits, you know, the bad hair days and really left it to, because all of us are like that, right? We're such a complex mix of um, so many things. The days we have thoughts we shouldn't have, the days, uh, the certain things we do, we, we regret later. So um, I kind of wrote them in um, the full sort of um, view, you know, well-rounded view and left it to the reader. And um, somehow I think that worked because, um, you know, Tolum for all his weakness, is a kind guy at heart, you know, that that came through. A lawyer for all her trying to be so strong and so dispassionate and so, you know, um, I'm all there sorted kind of person is obviously very, very vulnerable, you know, so it worked that way. I kind of just um, let them have it all in, in a sense and um, standing back um, at a safe distance and there, uh, this third person view um, really helped. Yeah, and I think in both your novels, the men are sort of emotionally unavailable. We don't know who they are really, the women are such strong characters, they almost like overshadow the men. Uh, in both the novels, to a degree, I'm not saying all men are equal, there's Robin in, in, in your uh, book, who is a very warm, generous, sort of giving man in that sense. Yes, but yes, Robin Correa. He's sort of um, very sort of retiring, yeah. and he doesn't want to sort of commit you're himself. Right. Yes, you're right, you're right, Shumag. I mean, I think it's um, the stronger women than men in the books, but I think Torun this time kind of holds his own. Uh, despite his various flaws, I mean, that's, he's obviously a very flawed person, but uh, he kind of is a fairly strong character in the book. And uh, I wanted him to have like, equal strength, you know, stand equal to lawyer in the sense. And Robin, of course, um, in the shadows, but very much there and um, very much a very uh, sort of um, strong anchor to the book. Yes. 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 I want to ask Avni actually about Dilip, because he seems to me such an interesting character who... <laughs> You could dismiss quite easily saying that, oh, he has no clue about what's going on in his wife's mind. But is that what you actually wanted to create? Because I can't make up my mind about him as a reader. I can't make up my mind about him as a writer either. I think um, I wanted to give the sense that he does, in fact, have a deep and interesting inner life. Um, the question is, because we're looking at him through the lens of, you know, through Antara's view of him, uh, how much are we able to see, in a sense, how much three-dimensionality is he allowed to have? Um, another thing that was interesting for me that I was sort of trying to discover through his character was uh, the particular conundrum of the um, American born of Indian descent kind of returning to India uh, to understand what his or her relationship is with the mother country and um, what that particular relationship looks like and you know what discomforts are inherent there and um, how the question of identity emerges in that particular context. And that was quite a personal uh, line of questioning for me because that's something that I did myself. You know, I moved to India in my twenties and uh, I, I think I had a very romantic vision of what it would be like to live in India. I always came to India as a child and uh, experienced it through you know, the domestic spaces and through my relationships with family members. But uh, when I actually moved there and lived there and began to work, um, it was again, very different. And so I was just trying to think around what that particular kind of identity crisis is like. I think I've, I always read growing up, you know, stories of uh, the Indian immigrant kind of moving from India to another country and um, negotiating that, uh, that set of problems or uh, questions. But this was, again, something a little different, had a different set of nuances. And I was kind of curious about what that might look like and what might emerge 
um, from his character. And you see with his character, he actually has, uh, he, he doesn't know, you know, in fact, how to um, identify himself really. And it's through kind of um, looking to religion or looking to, you know, some kind of ancestral idea of what it is to be Indian. Um, he takes on vegetarianism very strongly. He kind of is, you know, edging on sort of becoming a bit fundamentalist about it um, because he's trying to sort of understand, you know, how he is Indian and what it means to be Indian. And I, I see that actually a lot, I think, with, uh, you know, diasporic populations. So. Right, right. I think you also created a microcosm which was not the typical India that uh, a, a diasporic population would read about, especially setting your novel in Pune and then you know taking us back into the ashram. Um, I think this was before Wild Wild Country, right? So we were not quite sort of expecting that kind of uh, a kind of foray into that world in a novel of this nature. Um, so it was kind of thwarting also expectations and sort of playing with readers' expectations. That's how I felt it while reading it. Would you agree with that? That you were kind of trying to also steer clear of a certain cliche of India? Um, I don't think I was purposely steering clear of any cliches. I didn't really have cliches in my mind. For me, I grew up around Pune and I grew up around uh, a lot of women who belonged to the ashram in the Osho ashram at different points. And so it was always kind of there in the back of my mind and sort of in my imagination. Um, but I guess what ended up happening is because I am telling the story of the ashram through the eyes of a child, you're not seeing the ashram, you know, from this kind of place of, I don't know, you're not seeing it from the eyes of a kind of foreigner, or you're not seeing it even from the eyes of an adult. You're basically seeing yeah. it from the eyes of a, I mean, for, mm. I don't have a better word for it than a hostage in a sense, right? I mean, she is basically hostage in that ashram there against her will. And um, she suffers tremendous abuse and trauma there. And so I think from that perspective, the ashram isn't really an ashram. It's kind of um, a nightmare, if that makes sense. And I think I tried to write it in that way. Um, a lot of people have asked me about the ashram scene, you know, her first kind of memory, which is at the ashram. And I made a pretty, you know, um, pointed decision that I wanted to write that all the other scenes that are told in the past tense are written in the past, uh, all the other scenes from the past are written in the past tense. And that mm. was one scene where I said, uh, I need to write this scene in the present tense because for Antara, you know, it's, uh, it's a living nightmare. It's still very much there, you know, in her body. She still holds that trauma very much um, in the present. Right, right. I mean, uh, coming to this idea of Indian identity, I want to ask Janavi as well. It so happened that when your novel came out, we were having these very heated discussions about what it means to be Indian, the NRC in Assam, all these things were happening. But in your novel, there is a real turning of the personal into the political in a, in a very, very sort of fundamental sense, because that's what actually generates the conflict in the novel. Was that something uh, you had thought about for a long time, this whole idea of being rejected because of, you know, inter uh, marrying outside your caste, outside your family, uh, family's approval. Uh, but it somehow sort of came to coalesce at this time when we were having these conversations. How, how did this whole process happen? So the interesting thing is, Shoma, because I took so long to write it. When I was writing it, there was no question of the NRC. Yes. And in 2010, 11, 12, there was uh, no talk of NRC at all. But the year the book uh, was bought and in production, uh, November, December, it started. And um, it's almost like um, you, you get sort of goosebumps, you know, it's, it's just so prescient. It's so um, sort of almost as if I had a foreknowledge of it, but I didn't. I, I, I was writing it over a good eight, nine, ten years. What happened in Assam over three decades, as you know, in that um, no aspect of life could be separated from the political. And uh, I was in school, the last part of school there, uh, the 
five years of my medical studies there. And um, the political fed into our daily life. The morning, um, when you open the newspaper, um, it sort of set the tone for the day. If there was a bomb blast somewhere further down the street, you would be careful that day. Um, maybe you couldn't go to college. Maybe classes are suspended for a week. And um, it, it really, it wasn't, um, we were not isolated from it. It wasn't distant like you see something on television. It really, we had to um, figure out the route to college perhaps uh, through safer streets than the street where the bomb blast had happened or where there was already a curfew in place or cordoned off, you know? So um, anything said, somebody said, somebody said this to me that, uh, um, did you do this deliberately? Did you use this uh, sort of um, uh, inside outside a conflict in the family? Um, did you use the, the political um, stage to highlight that? I actually didn't have to think that much because any novel set in Assam from the early 70s to now cannot escape this, this stage. It has to be set against the background of what is happening. And what has been happening is um, this fear of being uh, sort of um, the outsider taking you over. And, uh, and naturally this huge uh, anxiety, which sort of leads to a flare up of resentment against the outsider. Uh, this is the, 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 the landscape outside. So, um, the natural fear of outsider, I always say, because our country is so big, we're so vast, there are natural differences, right? And unfortunately, this, this throws up what I said about uh, when we were chatting earlier about colors. Um, white is seen as such a beautiful color in Assam and all our all our ceremonies, um, we, we have to um, wear white. Um, when I came into the south of India, I married into a Konkani Saraswat family and um, partly Saraswat. And, um, it was that uh, don't wear white, it's, it's, it's uh, inauspicious. And you know, these little things throw up walls. And in the case of Assam, because suddenly we had this influx of people from outside and our very language, our very um, sort of identity uh, was sort of in, in danger of being swamped. Uh, but there is a very deep fear of the outsider. So um, the term used in our days was, uh, are you local, are you non-local? You know, so that, that sort of um, is always there outside. I didn't have to struggle too hard. It, the, the landscape was set from mark and uh, this marriage between um, a local girl and a non-local boy um, was bound to throw up all, all these um, sort of problems later. Uh, and this is, the, this is not like, um, I think, um, peculiar just to Assam. I think in, in any um, parts of India, in my generation, I'm, I'm glad to say it, it is on the way now, uh, marrying outside a community was uh, so, such a big threat, such an assault on the family that, you know, there were family meetings, there were family feuds, you didn't see your children for years. And this is what happened to Loya and Rukmini. Exactly. You know, the, this feels even more urgent now because the kind of time we are living through. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So as we said, when the book came out, actually, NRC, I think that by the time um, sort of the COVID situation took over, but um, there was this sort of resurgent mood of being, uh, you know, um, being threatened from the outside and um, that book sort of came out uh, on the background of that yes right right you know I, I your book is so rich in detail and and the specificities of the place that you write from and and the politics and the history of your of the place that you write about has it ever felt like a kind of uh, imposition that you have to almost like you know bring this truth alive as a responsibility, you know, as a writer from Assam, that you have to kind of capture this in the most truthful way that you can. Has it ever felt like an imposition as a writer? No, no. I think I just write about um, sort of um, the day and the rhythm of the day. And, you know, what's, um, I, I'm kind of a very visual writer. I don't know if it comes through in the book. Um, I see things. I see it almost like a, a scene set for a play. And um, the detailing is because the, the stage is being set the weather outside, the birds, the flowers, and so on and so forth. In fact, um, they're very interior scenes, but uh, with a lot of detailing, but it's being seen from the inside as such. Uh, in fact, to, to respond to what you said, um, I've been uh, no position to um, sort of um, display that, but I've in fact been asked um, as to why don't I do enough more of it? Why don't I bring the politics, the insurgency, the, you know, the alpha, the asu more into my books? So there's no imposition. I think it just comes in organically as to what I need for a scene or what I need for setting. I was particularly thrilled by the description of food in your book, really. I mean, that famous Assamese cuisine that like, you know, all the delicacies and all the everything that you sort of bring out so beautifully. Yes. So it was yes. really for a Bengali like me, it was very thrilling it's, to it's, read about. Yes, it's very similar. It's very similar to Bengali cuisine with um, delicate sort of subtle differences, yeah. No, right. food is such a big part of, I think, any Indian household, not just Assam or Bengal. And yeah. Um, yeah. the point of food here was um, 
not just the food itself, but to show how it is um, used as a tool to show love, right? And in Loya's case, she was never fed. Her mom never asked her what did she want to eat, uh, what her particular tastes were. So um, it's kind of, uh, I mean, used it as a tool of deprivation almost. You know, she, she wasn't nurtured enough. And when she comes into this house and Roman sort of puts this um, caramel custard in front of her, she, she breaks down because no one has thought enough of her to um, give her the food that she wants to eat. You know? And uh, I, I saw a lot of this in Avni's um, book too, where uh, Antara eats a lot, right? I mean, when, when, when possible, she does eat a lot. And I don't know if readers have got it, but um, and I may be wrong here, Avni, but uh, Antara and Loya both have this um, body image problem. You know, um, in the sense, I don't know if it's a problem, but they are girls who um, are larger than normal and uh, kind of a discomfort there. You know, you're trying to find home in many places and you're not even at home in your own body sort of feeling. You know? So uh, yeah, food was kind of an element in the book. Mm. Avni, would you like to add something to that? I think food, yeah, for me, food kind of was operating in various ways throughout the novel. Um, in my research of Alzheimer's disease, I found that recipes are actually one of the first things to go um, when people start to lose their memories. And so that was one way in which I was kind of um, mapping or kind of creating a sort of timeline for Tara, for the mother character to lose as she was losing her memory. She was you know, forgetting to put uh, potato in the sabudana kitri or, you know, she was forgetting like, and just, you know, a little bit earlier, she was making the bang and gabharta just perfect. So it was just this slow kind of, uh, you know, diminishment of her memory. On the other hand, yes, uh, in another way, yes, I think for Antara, for the, for the narrator, her her relationship to food is, um, it's connected to hunger, um, but she has many different kinds of hunger that are just uh, constantly, you know, not being satiated. And so she finds that satiation through food. Um, and it's this constant uh, play of um, sort of abstaining and sort of not allowing herself to eat and then gorging. And it, I think, it, but again, this is all, in my mind, it was all connected to, um, you know, feelings of worthlessness, feelings of not being loved, uh, experiences of trauma when she's a child and she's in boarding school. And it's interesting, I, I think like I have always associated um, fear and anxiety with the gut. I don't know, in my own experience. And so, you know, I guess I put that into Anthara as well, where she has this kind of unease in her gut all the time um, when she's in boarding school and she's being kind of abandoned by her family. She has these feelings of kind of bubbles um, of different, of, of varying, you know, shapes and different kinds of hardness. Um, you know, all up and down her throat, esophagus, down into her stomach. And so, so I don't know, for me, it wasn't just about food. It was about um, digestion. It was about what happens when, what, what's happening on the inside of the body when we're experiencing things externally as well. I was interested in that kind of uh, play between the exteriority and the interiority uh, of the character, not only from an emotional perspective, but a very like bodily perspective as well. That's really interesting because food is such a potent metaphor, right? Like you can do so many things with it to signify so many levels of unfulfillment, you know, all sorts of deprivations, as you said, fear, anxiety. I also wanted to ask both of you about uh, trauma and how trauma is kind of handed down the generations. In, in both the books as we see it. And it's sort of up to the current generation, the younger generation to provide the catharsis as it were. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about how this, what, what you make of this transference of trauma through the generations, the mother to the daughter um, in both cases actually? Um, yeah, so Shomak, um, in undertow, um, as in a lot of my other work, I think um, the relationships within a family, particularly uh, when you're young, 
particularly the relationship structures as they evolve when a child is young, um, I kind of feel they travel through the person's life. And um, I know that, um, you know, as you grow up, people say, uh, that happened to you as a child, get over it, you know. Um, you, do, you do sort yourself out, you do sort of um, um, put yourself together and uh, present yourself to the world and you deal with life and you carry on. But really, I mean, the things that happen to you as a child, sometimes are things you cannot get past. And um, it, it does trickle down. It does trickle down from um, above to the child below and really, really impacts how the family uh, functions. In, um, it, it's very clear in Loya and Rukmini's case that it was Rukmini and Usha's conflict, which um, could have gone two ways. Once Rukmini felt abandoned, um, there are some people who take the point of view that because this happened to me, I'll make sure this never happens to my child. I'll make sure um, uh, my mother was so harsh. I'm going to be the kindest person possible to everybody. But in this case, Rukmini did try, but she didn't have the tools. She didn't know how, because she'd never been in a very nurturing relationship with any women. Even after her marriage, she kind of had a very hard relationship with the women in her husband's family. And Loya um, didn't know how to be around women. And she instinctively is a generous, very warm person. She figures some things out and she, a lot of that side uh, came out later when she moved to um, Guwahati to be with her grandfather. But um, it's true, the mother's anxieties, the mother's um, uh, lack of expression, um, Rukmini's constant feeling of being rejected did absolutely trickle down to, to lawyer. And um, I'm often um, asked, why do I write so much about family? And I don't write about the big things in the, in the world, you know, wars, famines, um, political things. And I always say that to me, the, the, the universe is the family. Or the family is the universe, whichever way you look at it. And really everything begins in the family. Your experiences of love, of trust, and on the reverse of betrayal, of dishonesty, of uh, treachery, of feeling secure and secure. Everything I do feel stems from that um, crucible of the family. And um, as we read more, as we talk more now, we realize that yes, to, uh, for a lot of us, what we experience uh, as a child is is the training we carry out into the world, right? So in this case, Loya senses that in the um, uh, the point where she decides to leave her mother and move to Guwahati to find her grandfather and her, her history, her legacy, as it were, she kind of senses that she doesn't move now. Um, this this trickling down will will overwhelm her. She will she will become what um, Rukmini is today, and um, I think it's a really close connection. And I see it in Abhinay's book too, wherein um, honestly um, you need to sort of attack it head on and resolve your problems. I know it's, it's a very sort of um, naive way of looking at it, but uh, if you leave it to fester and ferment uh, in many ways, it, 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 uh, it only leads to more complications. I think there is, uh, you're right, because there's a kind of perpetuation of this trauma by Rukmini when, when she actually sort of hands it down to lawyer, as it were, without any hope, anything to sort of give her any, any solace. Yes. And lawyer is the person who actually breaks that cycle yes. as it, and, and it is through her that the family tries to gain some catharsis but you know horrible tragedy ends the possibility of it yes um so um Abhi, i was also wondering whether you would like to say something about you know the inheritance of trauma from tara to antara and the kind of person that antara has become because of tara probably yeah so i was thinking about uh the way trauma is passed down again, in several ways. So I was thinking about it, like from even a genetic perspective, like in terms of epigenetics, I was thinking about um, the kind of, you know, neurological realities uh, that, you know, when we are constantly engaging in certain behaviors, and we're constantly viewing certain behaviors as children, those kind of pathways get really strengthened and hardened uh, into place where they become very difficult to then break out of. And for me, thinking about uh, the way trauma is passed down was really about, it was really about thinking through certain patterns and repetitions um, that begin to emerge as you see the characters interact with one another. And it becomes a kind of, there's this saying that I really love um, from Alain de Botton where he says, he says, um, although I'm sure he's taken it from someone else, but he says that, uh, uh, we love, we, we look for, um, we want to suffer in ways that are familiar to us. So 
basically saying that even today, I look, I look for just say in a partner, uh, certain similarities to the way maybe if, if I fight with that partner in a way that my parents fought, there is going to be, there may be pain there, but there is going to be a certain kind of comfort to be found in the familiarity of that. And so I kind of was looking at that as a sort of uh, drama that was being played out. And I, 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 I wanted to play with that idea of the drama as much as possible. Um, so there are a few scenes, you know, there's one scene where Antara is having lunch with her mother and what begins as a really lovely calm lunch uh, kind of unravels and becomes, you know, the two of them fighting and the fight is so common and it's something that they ex have experienced so many times before that they're almost mouthing each other's words as they're speaking, as though they're almost feeding each other lines, um, you know, because it's just, it's a kind of map that they've kind of followed for their relationship for so long. And um, even I think the end scene is, I was in a way thinking of it as a kind of reenactment of all these patterns and in, in a kind of a form of a drama almost. Um, so yeah, I was trying to play, I guess, with the, with the theatricality of those patterns uh, and repetitions um, and how, you know, we, we kind of are constantly mirroring them with our family members in a sense. I, I was thinking of the word mirroring constantly, you know, while yeah. I was reading the book, because there's this constant kind of swapping of cruelty and kindness. The moment you think that she has softened towards her mother or the mother is being affectionate, there's kind of a brutal disappointment in the next scene. Mm -hmm. and, and it sort of happens to both of them so organically that you almost see them as reflections of each other. And it makes you scared that whether we actually become like our parents, you know, in spite of our best intentions and wishes and this whole struggle that we don't want to repeat the, whatever the failures, the disappointments of the generation behind us, whether we actually have no way of controlling that. They are kind of genetically ingrained into our systems, as you were saying. Yeah, I think it, it's difficult. I don't, I mean, this is extremely pessimistic. I don't know if I believe we um, overcome these things. I think it's really, it, it, it becomes your life's work to overcome uh, those patterns from childhood, I think. I think you spend your entire life trying to break out of them. Right. I mean, Janavi, would you also say the same for Loya and uh, Rukmini? Because they have sure. grown in each other's shadows and they've almost become like each other with, without even wanting to be. Absolutely. and. Um... As Avni said, that the, the two things what happens in, in um, childhood, um, what she said about genetics, uh, we know so clearly some, some things are genetically handed down, right? I mean, depression, um, certain kinds of personality uh, sort of um, patterns. And um, interesting things have come up in recent years wherein they've, they've looked at, studies have looked at, um, they say depression, and found that children who have had very stressful childhoods, like Antara has, like Loya had, are so much more likely to be depressed adults, you know? So these things have, have sort of fallen into place, these patterns. So trauma is physically, bodily, and mentally, psychologically passed down in that way. And uh, this mirroring, of course, I mean, I'm glad Loya had the sense to see that very soon she would, um, Rukmini was turning into her mother in a, in a different way, in a more muted, um, sullen kind of way, but she was a controlling mother. She, she sort of um, held the reins to the family's um, functioning. And um, Loya somewhere had a little bit of a, a glimmer of uh, wisdom to see that she didn't want to go down that path. And as Avni said, um, I think we spend all our lives trying to um, break out of what happened to us in childhood. And um, what could change, what could help us, which didn't happen to, let's say, Antara or to uh, Rukmini, is that a complete change of environment in that uh, what we call behavior modification in, in, in psychology. I'm speaking from my two years, I did sort of a house job in psychiatry just after my MBBS. And uh, one way to treat any kind of mental or psychological illness is behavior modification, wherein um, you deal with people who treat you very differently um, from what the last set treated you. You have a different environment, basically. So if Rukmini um, could have had the good fortune of going into a very loving, 
bustling, happy family, she may have been able to break out of some of the patterns of childhood, but um, mm -hmm. she kind of almost faced the same isolation and coldness she um, felt at home in the yellow house. And she remained a very sort of cold individual, um, individual right? Loya tries to break out of this pattern of childhood, but um, at some point you do see mirroring, you do see somewhere where Loya is um, um, kind of almost um, dismissive of a mother's pain, not caring uh, how Rukmini is feeling. So it, it does happen, yes. And also she speaks of themselves as a unit. You know, she constantly tells people, do you know how we lived? And this sense of we is almost like a one thing, you know, like my mother and I are just one. We were yes. sort of stuffed into this apartment and thrown out of the house by my father. And it felt like almost an entity, an organism, you know, yes. the two of them. She, she definitely felt that way. She kind of felt that this was a unit, um, kind of what I felt with um, Antara and Tara also, that it is we, you know, versus the rest of the world. And very much mother and daughter here were a we until, until um, she went to Guwahati and saw that there's a larger world out there for her. The rhythm of that house, she could fit into that house. And uh, that was when that window to the world opened, opened for her really. So right. I think it's so important. It's, um, if you want to break out of um, a dysfunctional kind of situation, it's so important that you have that one window open somewhere. Someone somewhere opens that window for you. you know? and yeah. It's yeah. up to you, of course, to break out or not. And on that note, I want to ask one last question to both of you. And to me, that window that opens out, in a sense, in both these protagonists' life, for uh, Antara, it's art. I mean, she, she became, becomes an artist. And for Loya, it's like her love for elephants. Would you like to talk about these two separate aspects in your books as one last thing that I wanted to ask you? Like, why the elephants and why art? Uh, for me, you know, my uh, first, well, I don't know my first, my second love is art history and uh, visual arts. And so it's always been really fascinating to me. I've, I think I maybe always wanted to be an artist and I never was ever any good at it. So I decided to study art history instead. And um, I think art acts as a really interesting and potent metaphor for um, a lot of the things that I was thinking of through the book, a lot of the themes, uh, particularly memory, um, especially in terms of Antara's interiority as a character. Um, also in terms of like, you know, the aesthetics of violence and uh, the aesthetics of trauma, what do those things kind of look like? How can those things kind of be um, translated into a visual language? So that was all, these were all things that were in my mind um, as I was writing. And uh, so, yeah, I think about that. Did you have a specific question about the art or just generally why I decided to? I just love the use of art, you know, the way she starts copying this photograph and, and that motif is so beautiful and it runs so consistently to anchor the reader almost in the narrative. Every time she picks up that thing, you know, you can sort of return to a slightly sort of relaxed position and look at her doing that little thing. Until the uh, end. <laughs> <laughs> Until the end. Yeah. Yeah. But, I'm, yeah, yeah, and I definitely even took, I, I kind of borrowed from my life a little bit. Um, there's a show that she curates uh, towards the end of the novel, or sorry, there's a show that she goes to see uh, towards the end of the novel about uh, the work of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Um, that's in a show that's being curated by an artist and uh, by a curator. And uh, that's actually exactly the show that I curated. To, I mean, some differences, but yeah. Right. So I did draw from my life a bit there. Janavi, would you like to tell us a little about the elephants? I think um, a similar sort of explanation I borrowed from real life. Um, I find, I find um, being in a forest, I find wildlife very soothing. I don't know if that's quite the way to put it, but there's a certain calm in uh, stepping into um, a wild place, which really takes you away from um, where you are. And if, it's, uh, if you're in a sad place, the best place to go is to go look at anything natural, just even a sunset kind of calms you down, right? And uh, I anyway have this um, soft spot for, uh, we, we regularly visit sanctuaries, we regularly see wildlife, and I've been doing it as a child. And um, I loved the movie Hatari when it came out. I don't know if you remember it, Shomak, you know, the little African <laughs> baby elephants. And, uh, and when I was looking for some sort of relief for Loya, what is it that she would feel some comfort from? And um, since I'd lived so long with her, I kind of had the sense she would enjoy wildlife. and. Um, Instead of you know a doll or a, a cut, sort of a stuffed teddy bear, I know she would she would go for baby elephants, and uh, it really was that window for her, that uh, little point of comfort for her. 
uh, which grew up into really um, sort of a, almost her career, her, her, her life's work in, in a sense. That there is something about uh, being out there within the wild which calms you down uh, when you realize you're just this tiny speck in this huge universe. And I think that's a very anchoring, very sort of calming thought for anybody. I mean, they are very gentle creatures, although they're gigantic, you know, they are gentle. Not always, not always. They, they, they can be fairly vicious. They can be very vengeful. They can be very human-like, actually, in their, in their ways. Right. Yes. But so thank you all three of you, Abni, Jandi, and Shomak, for making the time to be with us. And it's been such a pleasure to hear you talk about your process and your thinking behind the novels. Because as you, for, as, from a reader's point of view, you project so many things, saying this must be this, so that must be about something else. But it's nice to hear from you what your thought process was um, on all of those things and to learn about how you write. Uh, thank you so much, all three of you, for making the time. And thank you to our audience for joining in. Thank you. <laughs>